where you are. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're about ready to go here. I'm Rick Newman with Yahoo okay. Finance. We're here to talk about the labor force, what's, uh, what's working, what's not working, and for those things that are not working, what are some uh, solutions? Uh, I don't know if any of you saw this. I'm sure some of you did see this story in the Wall Street Journal this morning about a few towns that are actually paying people to move there uh, so that they have workers. I mean, this is a, a bizarre sounding situation. I mean, you, you think of companies sometimes offering a relocation uh, bonus or something like that, but not, not really cities. So that suggests, uh, you know, we've got a, uh, the uh, job growth has been strong. We know the unemployment rate is at 4.1%, very low. It's probably going below 4% some, sometime this year. Uh, you've got companies, many companies saying they, uh, they can't find enough workers even when they raise pay. And yet we've got these other problems that suggest things are not so, uh, so great with the labor force. Uh, labor force participation is weak. Uh, we still seem to be waiting for people to come off the so-called sidelines, people who are not in the labor force, not looking for work. Supposedly they're going to come out now that you know jobs are easier to get, but that's not happening. So we're going to try to uh, get through some of these issues and figure out what's the problem and uh, what, can, what are, are the problems and what are some of the solutions. So let me introduce everybody real quickly and we'll start talking. And we do want to um, uh, have some questions from all of you toward the end. So uh, you know, think what you'd like to ask us and uh, we'll make you part of the conversation. So I'll quickly do some introductions and we'll get started. You can obviously read everybody's bio. Pradeep Kosla uh, is chancellor at the University of California in San Diego. I just heard him say they have 37,000 students. That's a lot to manage. Uh, next to me is Daphne Kiss. She is the CEO of WorldQuant University. Now WorldQuant is the company, it's an investing firm, it's doing that lab experiment over there in the hallway. Um, I asked Stephanie about that. Um, we can do that offline, I guess. But this <laughs> WorldQuant University uh, is a right now a nonprofit that's interested in education, and it does uh, it is seeking accredited accredit accredit. What is that word? Accreditation. <laughs> Thank you. So it's it can uh, become, a, become yeah. a regular <laughs> university. Uh, to my left, Chauncey Lennon, uh, managing director and head of workforce initiatives for uh, global philanthropy. Global philanthropy. I'm not going to stumble over every four syllable word. I promise. <laughs> At J.P. Morgan Chase. Are you in New York? I'm in New York. Okay. Yep. And then Jane Oates, who is president of Working Nation. That is a nonprofit focused on uh, education and labor skills. So Jane, I'm going to start with you and ask you, could you frame the problem here? So we know what's working in the U.S. labor force. What is not working? So really, when Working Nation was founded by Art Bilger, he, was, he founded it to tell the stories of solutions. Everybody's talking about the problems. We know what the problems are. We know that people are graduating with associates, baccalaureates, masters, PhDs, and not finding jobs, not able to pay their loans back. 48-year-olds are getting uh, let go every day from household recognizable name companies that you would think were very stable and had some sense of job security. And all of those people, those college graduates, those people who went to work and worked hard and played by the rules, who are now in their 40s or 50s, the rug is pulled out from under them. So how do we get them to recognize what the programs are where they could get reskilled, where they could get the skills to fill the skills gap, and where they could get really the wraparound services to match them their skill level to the jobs that are laying vacant far too long. It's a crisis not only for individuals who are out of work or underemployed or on the sidelines, as you so adequately said in the introduction, but it's also a crisis for American companies and the foreign companies that have chosen to invest here. Every day that they have a job that lays vacant is a day that they lose money. Don't you, why is this happening? Uh, if, we, if we, on one hand, have companies saying, uh, we can't find enough workers. Why do we have this problem, on the other hand, with people who are losing their jobs or they, you know, maybe it's just part of the normal churn, right. uh, but then they cannot get into, an, into the proper job because they're not, like, why, is, why do we right. have this so problem? We, we got a couple problems. So the first is that, um, and, you know, we don't do ourselves any favor because we often describe this as the skills gap, which it partly is, but that implies that this is a supply side problem. If we just train more people, we'd have a fix. There's a lot of demand side problems. So employers are actually not that good at letting us know what jobs they're tr struggling to fill and what skills they need, right? So sometimes they know, they're just not good at telling us. Sometimes they don't know and therefore can't tell us. Sometimes they don't know how to work together in an industry, and so there's a clear signal. And so we, we need to get better at understanding you know, what these jobs are, what the skills are, right? With a stronger signal, we then need to build a much more uh, 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 clearly articulated pathway of training. We need to help people get the skills that are in demand 
But what we have is a very clunky system that was designed for, you know, 50 years ago, right? It has this four-year thing called high school, then this four-year thing called a, a BA. Uh, but, you know, we have lots of jobs that don't require four years of a BA, but they do require training past high school. And the world of that training, and those are about 50% of the jobs, uh, you know, is not really organized to help people understand, oh, I can take this sequence of courses, get this certificate, and get this job as a welder paying $60,000, or that sequence and this certificate, and get that job paying $65,000 as a pharma tech, right? We have to help people understand what these jobs are and then build pathways to these jobs that aren't simply gonna go from high school to college and, and create these alternative pathways into the labor Isn't market. Isn't it the employer in the employer's interest to be the one who takes responsibility for that? Plus the employer is really the one who has the resources to do that. Uh, why yes. Aren't, so why aren't they doing yeah, it? Yeah, yes and no. So I think we suffer from the idea that employers are rational actors. Right, that, they're, they're not. <laughs> that that they can actually, again, understand their interests and and act on them. And uh, it's a, just a much more complicated uh, world that we live in. Most employers just like they like loose labor markets when the talent they want is waiting at the door, ready to go to work. What you're describing up front, we live in the world of a tight labor market, and that is changing everything, right? Where employers are now recognizing they have to do a lot more to talk about not just the talent they want to attract, but as Jane was saying, income and talent, invest in training. Those aren't muscles that lots of employers have built. Uh, some bigger employers have done that, but even they need to think about doing it in a much more robust way. So we're entering a new chapter. So this is something WorldQuant is actually building, trying to build these muscles, right? Yes. So tell us what so, you're doing and how um, it's working. So World Context is more global view, perhaps, than some of our discussion here. And we have uh, nearly 2,000 students on our platform. It's a completely, our first program is a completely tuition-free uh, master's in financial engineering, which we think is uh, well aligned with what industry is looking for at the intersection of financial management, computer science, and data science. Uh, our students are all over the world. Uh, half our students are in sub-Saharan Africa. And from our perspective, we can be most sort of effective at the top line. Students who have graduated, have undergraduate degrees, and now need that next step in order to be effective in the marketplace. And one statistic that's kind of interesting is that um, <clears throat> about 38% of our students are between 30 and 39 years of age. So in some sense, they too are kind of reskilling, uh, have undergraduate degrees, have been in a variety of industries, and now we're understanding that these 21st century skills are a means for them to apply their capabilities to industries that are demanding the kinds of capabilities that they have. Is the purpose of this to train people so WorldQuant can hire them? <laughs> so, funny you should ask. No. Uh, so the, they're actually, it is a strong separation of church and state. And uh, anyone who engages in just one course at WorldQuant University is not eligible for employment at WorldQuant. Um, huh. for at least 12 months. So, but the general feeling is that if we sort of support and make this open, that that benefits all. And, so and WorldQuant funds it, or you get grants and stuff like that? <laughs> uh, it, is, it is funded by, by uh, WorldQuant Fun World Foundation. So at this point, it is all funded. Um, I will say that, to your point of pathways, that what we're really trying to do is build an ecosystem where capable talent comes in, might get in, might not. Through a re fairly rigorous application process, we attempt to uh, offer resources. You're kind of weak in this area. Take this Coursera course, come back, apply again, and sort of go through the process. And then uh, at the other end, to work with partners like people in this room and at this conference who might be interested in our employees. And of course, the silver lining in some sense of the sort of sad immigration situation that we're in is that our idea is to bring the, the skills to where the talent is, which is sort of a reverse of the model we've had in the past. And so we're able to help people in their local geographies have a meaningful economic high-level impact and apply the skills that we're teaching them to their local development. Pradeep, you've been involved with online education. What works and what doesn't? Well, we are primarily a residential campus. I just want to make sure uh, our involvement with online is primarily to scale what we do. Uh, so I think there's a lot of issues with online uh, where people seem to think that if you go online, you can cut the cost by a factor of three or four. Uh, people seem to think that uh, the learning outcomes are better. And I think what you will find out is uh, 
there's not enough work that's been done to convince us of any particular outcome one way or the other. So which is why the residential campus is alive and well. Which <laughs> is why if I were to pull this crowd here, how many of you will send your kids to an online, completely online four year degree? Okay, hmm. two, see? And this how many crowd, of you pay for pardon me? How many of you pay? How many of you will pay for college? <laughs> four year college, four years, see? So you can see that uh, it's not, it's not taking, uh, how should I say, it's, uh, it's not gaining traction as fast as people would have hoped. Uh, that's why a lot of these ed tech companies, which started off with a very high valuation, <laughs> very fast, have kind of slowed down a little bit. Uh, it's not clear to me which way it's going to be headed. I am not betting one way or the other right now. Is, but there, I, is there a follow-through problem with online education that it's somehow less motivating to show up for a class when it's, th when it's you know, through a camera? Yeah, so people will say that the dropout rates are high, the graduation rates are very low. Uh, but I think, I think the system that's going to work is some combination of residential and online uh, where there's a balance between in-person instruction and independent uh, learning uh, put together in a nice ecosystem. And I don't know if we are there yet. Can you do online education for things that are physical skills? <laughs> like could you teach somebody how, be, how to be a plumber um, in an online course? Look, I don't teach plumbing. I wish. <laughs> you know, this is being broadcast. I'm sure the UC system chancellors are looking at it. What the hell is this guy doing <laughs> talking about plumbing? Uh, but turns out, so take, for example, being an electrician. Uh, it's not clear to me that you could do it online. I think a lot of these trades, being an apprentice, is a strong part of the learning process. And apprenticeship comes only... Uh, in person, learning by doing, learning by watching. So it's yeah. not clear to me uh, it will be online. So uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, well, I just want to make a comment that, I mean, surely, you know, not all skills are the same as we know. And physical skills in the physical world are one. And probably to be an electrician, there's probably some great learning, uh, ancillary learning around what it takes to become an electrician that is very conducive to online learning. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it has a sort of practy piece to it that needs, is applied that is different than most of what is being taught in colleges, all right? It's yeah. not, you're not going to, you know, to UC San Diego to become a plumber. So, um, but, but I do think that, you know, to the extent that what we're talking about is the sort of application of human capital, as it were, mm -hmm. and the development of that capital, um, there are, you know, certainly being together helps. And one of the things we're trying hard to do is now having these thousands of students you know, we have hundreds of students in Lagos. This is early days for us. But one of the things we can help them do, for example, is yes, they study online and they might do a collaborative project with somebody in Singapore online, but they might come together with other students in Lagos to study. Mm -hmm. Okay, we could use a tool like Meetup Hybrid. to help them yeah. find one another, right. not by definition because it's a residential college and they physically, but because we use the technology to enable a hybrid of experiences that make it as enriching as possible. So I really think you yeah. should not put the, uh, the idea of simulations and virtual yes. reality aside as a learning option. Yes. Because what Pradeep is saying when he talks about a campus experience is predominantly for 18 to 22 yes. year olds. Right. That's right. And for a 40 year old who's thinking about is welding for me since I just got laid off from retail, being able to go through that simulation or that virtual reality could tell them whether it's worth their money and their time to go into a 16-week program to get an AWS certification. Mm -hmm. So let me try to get, and you guys can all jump in at this point, um, let's try to identify the real hot spots here. Uh, so mm -hmm. for example, um, I, I've covered this in various ways and I don't think there's a problem uh, with people, the only problem at the high, highest uh, skill level of the uh, workforce is that there aren't enough people with STEM degrees. It, there, there is no mismatch. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's a mismatch problem there. In the U.S. Okay, in the U.S. Uh, now I, I do hear from people uh, who are st in, the st in a STEM field, but maybe don't have the latest training who get laid off from IBM or some I Intel. I mean, this happens in kind of a surreptitious fashion, but a lot of these people who've been doing these jobs, uh, COBOL programming or something like that, uh, for years, suddenly that division is being disbanded and you don't hear much about it. But, but there are people out there who thought they had a job for life 
uh, and now they can't figure out how to get hired in the tech economy, even though they, they have these tech skills. Then we have a lot of things roiling in the middle skill area and in the low skill area. So I think it'd be great to, um, let's, let's identify the real hotspots here. Who wants to grab that? Oh, I think I would, <laughs> I would throw out there from, from certificate post high school certificate all the way up to PhD, yes. cybersecurity. I would throw out right. there data analytics. I mean, I would well, say- Well, those are the hot fields, right? Right. What I mean is, what are the problem areas? What well, are the problem areas? People where, we, are, where, where are the biggest mismatches? People are That's not yet teaching those courses in to the level they need to be in traditional education, and people have not figured out how to give people short-term certificates so they can get started in those fields to scale. Yeah, and I would add that we, we simply aren't letting young people know and their families about these options, right? Yeah. So we, we are, you know, the economy is churning along. These, these skills uh, are in demand, but there's no way to help, uh, you know, a high school junior know that look you have to take a sequence of courses or you should really start taking it freshman year and maybe get a certificate so you can come out of high school and start getting on the pathway to that job. Right. We don't have the muscle to let the world know about what we're looking for. So and I've spent a lifetime in this and yeah. I have to tell you Daphne I have never heard of the job title financial engineer until I met you. So that's just saying what do <laughs> wow. you do if you have two parents who have worked in retail their whole lives how would they even know that's a pathway to go. So I think it's great that you're out there talking about it because I didn't even know it was a job title to be perfectly so, honest with so you. So I think part of the problem that we should be willing to face is a typical American family really believes that a four-year degree is a path out to upward social mobility. They're not wrong. They, no, I mean, they, they are. Yeah, right. Wait, wait well, a second. On average, they on may average. not be all wrong, but it's not all correct either. That's right. Because if you look at the history of this country, upward social mobility happened a lot in mid-America in the normal manufacturing jobs when the economy was going, when the jobs were more evenly distributed across the whole spectrum from low end, uh, very low service oriented jobs to very high end uh, jobs in let's say financial engineering. I think what we are seeing right now is a completely tech dominated economy where between bio and tech is exactly where all the wealth is being generated and a lot of these people, so the low end manufacturing and the middle end manufacturing is not non existent pr pr primarily. So, so I think just teaching people more cybersecurity, which by the way is happening a lot, the US government mm -hmm. is spending a lot of money doing that, uh, doesn't quite solve the problem because there's a big mismatch between where the jobs are and where people live. Uh, if you, no, seriously, and uh, used to be that cities would. Uh, bribe companies and give them tax incentives to come and create jobs in their location and that's not working anymore. So it's a very complicated story right now. Go ahead. Well I, well, I just wanted to actually add that one thing I didn't mention is that we've just launched a data science module. Um, we have our first class that started in the beginning of, of April and it is a not sort of where you just go online and look at videos, it's actually access basically inside a Linux server where you can, can learn about data science, where it's not all right and wrong answers, but it's iterative in terms of the learning process. Uh, we have 200 students. The next cohort will have 500 students in it. Mm -hmm. It's eight weeks. You're in there. You do projects. You learn. You iterate. And the function of the instructor is to have office hours twice a week where the questions, uh, the um, most questioned issues are raised and addressed by the instructors and then they're available beyond so you're sort of taking the model and you know it's that sort of original I guess Khan Academy inversion where you have instructors who are there to answer what people can't figure out peer-to-peer -peer. now uh, we have students in there who are high school students a few okay who you know whatever learned R and now want to learn Python or um, so I think that there, there's a lot and Part of our interest in doing that is to sort of span that level, high level, and then that lower level where actually someone's at a job and they realize if I learn data science, you know, I'm at an ad agency and they need an analyst. And if I did this for eight weeks, maybe I can get that job instead of being a media buyer or whatever it might be. I mean, so I think that we need to approach this in a sort of broader kind of across vertically across the spectrum idea. I, I went to all the sessions on higher education since I've been here. And, you know, there, the, you, I went to Davos in January and all everybody's talking about how we need the talent and we can't find the talent. 
Then I went to the EdTech conference, and you have all these EdTech companies with innovative technologies, and they're all you know, eager to sell to institutions like yours. And then you come to a yeah, conference right. like this, and people are talking about, I mean, the, the, everything everybody's saying is right, but the, it's sort of like we need to kind of re-meet, all right? These very siloed industries, whether, you know, in order to get computer scientists, you have to teach it in K to 12. You have to make it a requirement that that is one of the science courses that you need to take. So it, it sort of comes across the spectrum. But I think that part of the problem is that it's just so siloed. The approach is so siloed that... Um, I mean, we're actually talking about a bunch of different silos. Yes, so we're exactly. talking about a bunch of That's right. sort of related problems, but they're actually mm -hmm. discreetly different and all somebody else's responsibility. Right, exactly. And so there's, you know, the idea of bringing that all together from start to finish is, is, is I think, so a worthy goal. Can so I have a thought on one hot spot? I think, I think creating a federally funded national database, matchmaking database, which is <laughs> legitimate, okay? Not like this crappy internet, submit your resume and uh, somebody will call you with a $10 an hour job. But a legitimate need and uh, like uh, what I'm able to offer versus what the needs are skills and a uh, job-based database I think would be very significant. I think we are, what we are lacking is a complete matching service right now. And then some policy on mobility of people. People are not as mobile. I mean, the higher end of the population is very mobile. You know, people who are sitting in this room. But the lower end, you know, if you are like an electrician, you don't pick up from Pittsburgh and move to uh, the Bay Area. Well, why not? Uh, but I mean, I'm why don't you? I mean, well, you know, electrician we, today, you're making a lot of money. I mean, so we, I know. we, know, we, know, that, we yeah. know that <laughs> labor mobility in the United States is lower it's than right. it used to be. I mean, right. people yeah. do not move around yeah. as much as they used industry. to. Like, right. why yeah. don't we? Yeah. Because know. it's too expensive to live well, in San Francisco. And people so. are underwater on their house, <laughs> yeah. and people are but not in Iowa, which I'm where, they're, where they're, they're those cities that are saying, <laughs> we'll give you $5,000 to come here. I mean, sure. And well, by the way, I mean, if you, without getting really off track here, I mean, if you talk about the startup world, that's, there have been several sessions here about that, about the idea of re infusing cities in Iowa, for example, or Pittsburgh or else, I mean, where, where there's a lot of innovation. And the idea that people who are educated, can go move to these communities and start their startups and be the source of employment, and they don't physically need to live in San mm -hmm. Francisco anymore, but can you know Pradeep, run companies? Pradeep, I, I, li I, I like your idea of a job matching service. Who should build that, and why don't you build it? You know, I'm about to say it should be the feds doing no. it. Oh, uh, no, no, no. No, thank you. I, I knew, exactly. I knew this crowd right. The would only say, thing that moves no. slower than but, education is right. government. But understand, but look, the problem is that there's a lot of these services right now on the Internet which are all garbage. I mean, yeah. it's all, they're just collecting your resumes for your name and number and your zip code and then selling it for advertising, but there's no real... But the good news is that we are in a moment of sort of this innovation and workforce tech, and there's a whole host of new kinds yes. of job matching tools out there. And we're just sort of in a phase of sorting out which ones are actually going to be the ones that will actually define the market. You know, technology now allows us to match not just on what you say in this thing called a resume, but actually uh, measure aptitudes, measure interests, Employers, again, employers don't do a very good job saying what a job is. So you yes. know, we're going to go through a phase over the next decade of really sort of seeing what comes out of that market. But the good news is that we're actually using technology to fix the matching mm -hmm. challenge. And I really like the ones that are competency-based. Yeah. Because when you go back to what are some of the problems for people not getting a right match for a job is there's all kinds of degree inflation. Yeah. There are jobs right. out there that use a bachelor's degree as an indicator for ability to learn. And they re you really don't need a bachelor's right. degree for that program. Yeah. So I I think the more we can get to tools that are competency based, I think we're going to be able to make much better matches and therefore, you know, have much more room for people at all educational levels. So, uh, what is everybody's best idea for who should be responsible for that? Does it have to be localized? Is it possible to do Amazon. on a national level? So should, it, should it be should industry? It shouldn't be national. No. Um, should I not be national? We, no, okay. uh, because labor markets aren't national, right? right? Um, I think the other thing we have to understand, and we're trying to work on this as well, is that uh, we don't really have a, a very rational system of credentialing in the U.S. You can't actually look at a database of all the credentials that are out there. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Lumina, and other funders, along with a set of businesses and the Business Roundtable, are building a database that will try and organize credentials so that you can go say, oh, I want to become uh, a welder. Let me understand what credentials are available, what employers value, 
how much they cost, and what is the track record of you know, that credential versus a different other credential. But again, it's amazing that we live in an economy and a labor market that we don't have that. Right? You can learn more about the quality of the pizza place down the corner from Yelp than you can by going online and looking for a credential. Information. Is this a startup possibility? Could, you, uh, could somebody make money doing uh, so this? So the way this is going to work, it's Last called Credential time. Engine, is actually you want this to be like weather data, right? We want, we, this is a public good, right? Understanding all the jobs that are out there, the skills that go with them and the credentials. You then want industry to go use that data to create apps and other kinds of tools that would allow people to navigate and make use of that data. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the vision for that, uh, that particular initiative. What, and I think it has real potential when that big national database, when it's finished, is taken to the local level, like one of the so first buy-ins was So who is Milan. doing this? So it's a partnership. It's a, you know, it's an interesting collaborative. It's not government. Right. Uh, it's a set of employers. It's a set of researchers, so labor market researchers, and a set of uh, funders. The uh, unions are involved. The military is involved. Anybody who's out there issuing credentials, it's in their interest for there to be more transparency about the universe of credentials. And so we're bringing those folks together. Is, this is online, or it's, it's called Credential it? Engine, and the, the website's credentialengine.org. But are the jobs posted? Honest to goodness jobs in there. So it's not, again, it's, it's about it's, it's solving the first problem. Right. There's many problems here. If we right. don't know what credentials are and employers ask for credentials, you can have all the matching you want. Like until we clarify that, it's going to be, the okay. tool is going to work. And credentials is more like professional credentials than. Right, right. It's that. everything from BA to welding to nursing to, the, you know, there's, there's literally hundreds of thousands of credentials out there, but they're, they're not organized and there's not transparency around which ones are valued by who. Huh, okay. Right. I just wanted to make one nuance to what you said, which was skills. And I think that part of the challenge here as we talk about this re-engineering is that we need to talk about capabilities, right, Vers rather than skills. So your point earlier, the guy you said who, you know, has been programming for dozens of years in COBOLs and blah, blah, blah. Well, that person is a l person who likely <laughs> might be good at learning R, right? So it's about capabilities. It's not about the actual skills per se that they have. It's about... So somebody who'd been a welder might now be well suited to a set of, of professions and, and that are leverage their ability to whatever, you know, physically manipulate or to understand whatever the capabilities are and the nuances are. Because I think that's part of the challenge is that people, everybody talks about you're going to have 20 careers over your lifetime, you this, and we never talk about them as your sort of propensity and capability, all right? For, for us at World Quant University, clearly you need to have the capacity to look quantitatively at information and data, all right? That is a prerequisite. And you want to find the people who may never have heard of such a degree, but in fact have the capabilities to take advantage and to leverage it and to re-engineer their lives in such a way that they can keep recreating themselves for decades to come. You know, so uh, I, I've covered this a lot, uh, and every time I write a story that uh, says anything about companies that can't find workers, I hear from workers who say, well, there are no companies like that where I live, and I've got this training, I've got a master's degree, I've sent out 50 resumes, I, I don't even get a response to my resume. It's right. like, what is broken right. in that system? Yeah. Lack well, of that's imagination the software. On the I mean, is, it so, well, is that what it is? Is it bots? You cannot even get uh, an interview anymore. You can't get a chance to sell yourself. And when Working Nation goes around and looks at solutions, it's about connectivity. It's about partnerships. Mm -hmm. People who are working together to inform everybody about what the job titles are in that local area and the people who have in Daphne's words you know the capabilities and may not have the skill set that's listed know who to go to to get those and the employers are watching that and hiring those people that's why the fix can't be on a national level I mean I so agree with Chauncey when he says labor markets are local Working Nation believes solutions are local. They can be taken to scale, they can be adapted in other mm -hmm. communities, but to think that there's one answer that's going to work in Gary, Indiana, and work in New York City, and work in San Diego, that's a pipe dream. Are employers fine with this? Uh, we, you know, we turned half of our HR department into algos, um, and we have, you know, if you get through the four, the, you know, the four software programs, then you actually get to talk to a person, and yet we can't find enough talent. I mean, our companies, do, do companies not recognize this is maybe part of the problem? I think increasingly companies are real. I mean, we went way down this road of, you know, you can use algorithms. Uh, you know, we've got monster, we've got these, you know, big online job boards that just increase, increase the flow of resumes. I think there's a pretty widespread sense that that did not work, right? Now we're unwinding that and trying, as Jane said, 
A lot of employers are creating partnerships, uh, whether with community colleges or other kind of training providers, education institutions, to create this kind of more seamless linkage. That allows them to inform curriculum and sort of share information and create work-based learning opportunities. But this kind of large open market, let's just do it virtually with a resume and a job posting, I, I think there's a pretty widespread sense that that, yeah. that has I mean, you look at, run its course. Look at Wes Bush. We've both yeah. been in the, in the audience when Wes, Wes Bush, the CEO of Northrop Grumman, talks about they hire 95% of their new hires from their intern base. Yeah. Now that's telling me that they know that the system the way it is is broken and they're fixing it by getting a look at people on the job in their own plants and their own offices and figuring out those are the match for me. Yeah. And I think if you really uh, polled employers right now you'd find a lot more of them from the John Deere's of the world and the South Wires mm -hmm. of the world who are taking talent right out of high school and then paying for their baccalaureate mm -hmm. degree you know mm -hmm all the way up to people that are looking at 48 year olds. I mean, we need to get more 48 year olds in those. It's not just about Robert De Niro in a funny movie. Yeah. It, we really need <laughs> to give internships to older workers right. as well to really get to these mm -hmm. solutions. Um, do you, uh, for those of you who work with companies on this problem, is there a sense that, yes, okay, let's say we have a tight labor market and maybe even a shortage of workers in some areas, but we're late in the business cycle, this is not gonna last, so we don't wanna to invest too much in this because we're probably gonna have uh, you know, more available workers before long. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'm cynical, I'm yeah, a journalist. No, I'm, yeah. I, I hear you, and I, I, I would, is that it, a yeah, thing? it would be naive to think that's not happening. I wouldn't say that I've seen much evidence that it's happening, yeah. right? I think what most employers are now recognizing is that, again, th this is all happening in a world in which you know, skill demands are increasing, right? So even frontline workers, right, the skill demands have gone up, healthcare, right? Gigantic chunk of the U.S. economy, uh, we are changing how we pay for healthcare. That's changing the requirements from the person who serves food to the person who cleans the room to everyone else up the chain now is accountable for quality because that's what drives the healthcare payment system. Mm -hmm. That transformation uh, is not going away, right? And that is going to make employers have to think very differently about how they hire healthcare talent, how they train healthcare talent. So I think there are some shifts here which are not just about the types of labor market, they're about how uh, the complexity and the demand for skills is just uh, shifting across the board. So let me um, ask mm. about the um, sort of the bottom of the labor force or the lower skilled end of the labor force. Uh, this is a very difficult situation because a lot of people graduate from high school without very good skills. That's the, kind of the fault of the education system. Uh, and then I think a lot of people just don't know what, where to go. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, there's almost this idea that if you don't have at least something more than a high school education, technical training, or I mean, it doesn't need to be a bachelor's degree, but you need something more, uh, or you just have no place in this economy. You are kind of an economic zero. Is that in fact true, or are there better ways to think about this and do something about it? Oh, I think that's true. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, at least one year of post-secondary yeah. education is going to become the norm. Yeah. It's just, you, and, and if that one year doesn't end up in an industry-recognized credential, you're going to have very few options. Yeah. And I think that you're starting to see people say that more and more. But I never want to lose the value of a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD. The data is pretty clear on that. You know, if you have a bachelor's degree, you're going to make two and a half times more mm -hmm. than a, th someone who has just a high school education. Looking backward, looking forward, that may change. But there's no question that you're going to be, you're, you're going to need skills. Well, and so the definition of those skills could be very so different. For, I mean, forward. for a lot of people, the road just ends at high school, yeah. and they know maybe there is I should be doing more, but they don't know what what it should be. Right. I mean. Right. College is just sort of like you just go there, and then you right. once you're there, you can you can decide to study one thing, but then you can change your mind. Yeah. You know, um, well, what the, are the best programs out there for what to do after high school if if you're not really sure, but, the, but you don't want to go to college? The point or is you that can't afford college. Unlike our our competitors across the globe, we wait until the end of high school to start that process. Yes. every other advanced country, you yes. start that in high school. High you school. figure out what yeah. career you want to be on and you have opportunities to do career-focused learning in high school so that when you exit, maybe you're exiting with a certificate, so you can go to labor market, or maybe you're going to get post-secondary training, whether it's a short-term certificate or a two-year degree or a four-year degree, uh, but we do not actually start the process of helping people become aware of career opportunities and to begin to develop, to go have internships, all that, you know, our competitors start that younger, and therefore they don't see this, you know, challenge you're describing, which is kids exit high school with no so, idea but, what comes so, next. But, but, you know, part of it is that societies, I mean, we, we have, you know, our education system is so privatized compared to some of those places that you're talking about, where there is an understanding early on that you're, it's publicly funded higher education, 
And so the notion of tracking and identifying people's capabilities, perhaps, uh, is, is happens a lot sooner in most of the world, unlike the United States. I mean, this four-year college thing is a real sort of American phenomenon That's in right. certain ways that, that really doesn't work in the rest of the world. And I think with, you made the point yesterday, as I recall, Brandon, I mean, wasn't it this whole sort of conversation about the value and that on the one hand, the debt has ballooned in terms of, of how much debt there is for student four debt. years, student yeah. debt there is, and yet there's this shifting perception of what the value of a college education is. And those things are like on a collision course with each other in some way that, that you know, the answer to which has to come from the So you, it doesn't like, take oh, Congress yeah. passing a law, which Congress can barely do, to force for local school districts to try to start implementing these kinds of things. Right. So local this school districts have nothing to do with federal legislation except in special That's my ed. that's my point. But, I mean, but, but you could you yeah, could be no. making these reforms at the local and they are. Or regional I mean, there's level. Some, so that is this half that's oh, what there's some K twelve yeah. districts yeah. that are I mean the yeah. biggest example that everybody probably knows is P Tech. You know the P Tech well, I, I don't so, yeah. so assume we don't IBM started it and literally you graduate from high school with an associate's degree or an industry Where recognized is that? credential. They're all over the country. The first one was in New York City. Yeah. So but even in, in California, there's a lot of yeah. high schools. The counselors are pretty uh, well aware and educated in this, right? So I'll give you an example. So I was at a high school. We go there very often to make sure that the pipeline is continuous to UC San Diego. And this young man, he said, he's going to be a welder. I said, what type of welder? He said, underwater welding. And I said, how come? Now, how many of you would think of underwater yeah. welding? In high school. In high school. The guy is in Great 11th job. grade. Yeah. And pays like 150 grand yeah. a year. Yeah. I mean, it is one of the... Yeah. Both tough and uh, like dangerous yeah. jobs. It's both difficult and dangerous. Very skilled yeah. jobs, right? And I'm thinking, you know, this is spectacular that this young man really knows what he wants to do, and somebody was counseling him in the right way, and he was going in the right direction with matching his skills and his interests. I mean, the biggest story in U.S. education right now that people don't understand is how high school is being transformed around the idea that we need more, more career-focused education. Uh, there's not a governor in the country that's not talking about how he's moving his state system to have more career technical education. Uh, last year, there was over 250 pieces of legislation at the state house level, whether that was policy or budget, uh, around how we build stronger CTE systems. And so, if you don't have a kid in high school, if you're not a kid, in you don't have a kid in middle school who's thinking about what pathway I should choose in high school, you're not seeing this transformation. It, it cuts against everything we think about American education, which it doesn't We're really. We're not respond. used to good news on education. It doesn't really adapt. But you know, this is, I think, one of the biggest things. And if you follow this, so I use the term CTE, career technical education. That's what we use today to describe what we used to call vocational education. Mm -hmm. But 30 years ago, uh, vocational education was left dead at the side of the road. And if you had predicted that this would be the thing that American education would adapt to and grow uh, in, you know, in, this in this era, uh, you would have been laughed out of the room. So, and I yeah. love dual Ooh. enrollment. Yeah. I mean, I think. What is dual enrollment? Dual enrollment means while you're in high school, you're getting college credit. In some really right. advanced places, mm -hmm. junior year English gets you not only the Carnegie unit towards your diploma, but three college credits in mm -hmm. English. Yeah. There are more and more kids, I think it's tens of thousands now yeah. across the country, not, it, not where it should be. Yeah. When they leave high school, they have an associate's degree. So when they choose to go to the University of California in San Diego, they start as a first semester junior. Yeah. And they might take three right. years because they want to do more lab science, they right. want a, a degree that requires right. more time, but they have already had their first two years free. So it seems uh, worth asking and maybe important to ask, is this a sort of a segregated effort that's taking place in wealthier school districts, mm -hmm. so but not in poorer or urban right. school districts? So, so I, I know New York City, there's a, there are several uh, funders and philanthropists, people in the VC community, who have worked really hard to get computer science into New York City public schools. And there are several initiatives in that regard to make that part of the core curriculum. If you talk about 21st century skills, yes, there will be some underwater welders and there a will lot. be yeah. a lot. I mean, apparently in cl uh, plumbing and electrician, the in expected rate of growth is 15% year over year for the next five years for those trades. But above and beyond that, to the extent in a global economy that we're competing around mm. these sort of more, you know, again, human capital skills rather than physical skills, there are lots of endeavors going on. Right. And again, New York City, it's not just in districts. In New York City public schools to put computer science and to do staff development so that because of course 
one without the other doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You need to train capable staff to be able to teach computer science, whether that's volunteers from industry coming in and educating them and providing that education. But I think one of the things, again, I, and I'm struck by it, again, having listened yesterday to all those higher ed panels, that by, even at this conference, we're having these really segmented conversations. So, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, it, this stuff needs to come together. Well, education is segmented. Isn't that but, part of the but, reason? But, but here we are saying, but here we are saying that in fact, education needs to be more agile and be agile so that it can look to what industry is looking for and what the marketplace is looking for and teach people those skills before there's this, you know, such a misalignment in terms of years that you're always in a lag situation. So again, I, I, you know, I think there's just an agility in education that needs to happen. And I think it's true among younger teachers. They expect those tools. They expect it to be iterative. They expect it to, to be in real time, you know. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of the misalignment of all of this that's such an issue, you know. So your answer was this is happening at least in urban schools. I, I'm not sure I would call New York City a poorer school district. There, uh, there certainly are others. Well, is that, does everybody agree with that? So or or is, there the a, is there a segregation Island. problem yeah. here? Yeah. Rhode Island, yeah. Gina Ramonde made it at yeah. one of her major right. issues the first right. year she was governor right. that at the Rhode Island is going to turn around. And right. I think we would all agree that Rhode yeah. Island is smaller scale, probably the yep. scale of New York yep. City public schools. Yeah. But I mean, there are things yeah. that are being done and are going to so continue to be done. Delaware has yeah. transformed the entire state. Uh, Colorado, uh, you know, they're they're going all in on building a Swiss apprenticeship model. I was just in a high school in mm -hmm. uh, Southwest Denver. Uh, I sat down with uh, four students who, you know, starting their junior year, they were at that building Monday, Wednesday, Friday, on Tuesday, Thursday, they were off at an employer, uh, working two days a week, right? So. They're remaking that school system to allow students who want to do apprenticeships to do that. Other students are just doing very intensive uh, you know, pathway programs and then working in the summer. So again, we're seeing really uh, interesting experimentation, but you're raising a really important issue, which is that the reason we got rid of vocational education is that it was a dumping ground for you know, sort of low income, kids of color. Mm -hmm. It was not a great system and we wanted to create access to better quality um, uh, opportunities. The deep irony here is that I think we do have to be concerned about as we invest in high quality uh, career technical education and you know, high demand fields, that more middle class families are going to scoop that up because that's a valuable resource. And so now we've actually got to find ourselves thinking about how we ensure access and equity to these new programs that are sort of the, the so best if you of were, the old programs. So if you were uh, listening to this and you were a, a kid who was interested in this kind of thing in a school that did not offer it, mm -hmm. or you were a parent of that kid, yep. what would you do? to go find it. How would you go find that opportunity for your kid? Are you There's some great online yeah. options, you know, that you can learn some of the stuff. You can do coding and things online. There are ways to supplement, but I think it's also, I don't say this is the first thing, but it's also important that parents advocate for better things, yep. that they learn about these other options and go and get active with their school board at the K-12 level. They go and talk to their colleges, their four-year colleges, mm -hmm. and say, you're a dinosaur you know, wake up, we need to do something else. Right. And, you know, I think we all, we all know that if there's enough noise, right. that things right. will begin to change. And I don't think we should ever uh, not engage employers in it. Because if an employer leaves a community, that community suffers, not right. just the people who work there, the entire community. So getting an employer base to go into the school, whether it's a community college, a four-year college, or K-12, and say to them, we need to partner with you, not by giving you money, although we may give you money, we want to change your curriculum. We want to help you look. And I think even a four-year college, Pradeep, you can tell me this, the colleges that we've come in contact with at Working Nation tell us they have a real difficulty finding faculty that can mm -hmm. teach the current and future skills because their faculty came from that world and knows what happened in the past but might not know what's happening right now, particularly in you know, device development, manufacturing in, in pharma. I mean, you have places like Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. and MIT who are always on the cutting edge, but how do people get the faculty for that? How do they get the faculty for new technologies? Colleges around the country are having difficulty, and California is a wealth of talent. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you're somewhere in the middle of the country, you're really having a dip. Not, it's not just nursing faculty. You're having a hard time finding More people need to go to World things. Quant University and, yeah. get, and get qualified. That's right. Exactly. No, this this that's is going right. to be the next big challenge is we're not going to have, an, uh, you know, certainly a high school, but I think that's right, a, a secondary uh, 
uh, workforce of teachers who are going to come yes. be able to teach these technical uh, yes. skills. So a question about community colleges, which were sort of the, the thing that replaced shop class yep. in a way in the 90s, of kind of what you were talking about. Um, I know that in some communities there are, you know, local businesses do partner with community mm -hmm. colleges and say, we well, hear the t skills we need, we're going to help you arrange the program. Um, are we making good use of community colleges or is this a kind of an underutilized resource? So I think uh, state institutions are. I can tell you, like, within California, the UC system is by far the best system in terms of creating a pathway from community college to a four year degree. So, for example, we are mandated to get one community college transfer for every two freshmen we admit. It's a man. So for every two freshmen I admit yep. to UC San Diego, I got a one community college uh, to one. transfer soon, right? Okay. Two to one. Uh, most states, that's not the rule. And most private institutions, uh, the ones that uh, Jane named, are basically delinquent in terms of uh, to maintain their stature. They have left the community colleges by the wayside, which I think is extremely unfortunate. Uh, I think the 48-year-old you're talking about, community college would be a good pathway to go and get re-energized and retrained and then go into a four-year program after that or two more years after that. Uh, I think we're not exploiting it well enough. I think community colleges, in my mind, were a great idea when it happened, but we just left it by the wayside, just like vocational education. Yeah. Yeah. I think yesterday the, the chancellor at UCLA, what did he say, 40 percent of graduates uh, come from have been our transfers from community college. Yep. So and that's, that's something that's mandated in California? So that's oh, a law, yeah. a it's, law requires it, that? It, no, no, it's not the law. It's something called the master plan. So it's about 50 years old. And the master plan is a genius of a document, which basically differentiated between the UC, the Cal State, and the community mm -hmm. college, uh, where the top, I think, 12% were to be admitted to the UC or 10%. Yep. And then within the UC, for every two freshmen, we got to take one uh, transfer. So student. other states could adopt something like that. They There's could, no but uh, they don't. And uh, what I'm <laughs> concerned about is the private institutions. So here's the thing, right, which, which people don't understand. Every four-year institution in this country is government funded, whether you like it or not. They may have private governance, but they're all living off of the federal Pell Grants, the federal research money, the state mm -hmm. research money. I can just go down the list, right? And there is no mandate on these institutions to make community colleges part of their intake. Um, we're going to take some questions in a minute or two, so get them ready. Um, let me ask, we, we talked a little bit before about labor mobility. Should, uh, should there be incentives for people uh, to move around more than they do? Is that a solution, or is that would just be throwing money? Well, we, away? You know, we, we don't spend a lot of money on training in this country. Right, so I think yeah. it's important to recognize. Um, you know, Pell is a is a leave Pell aside, but when it comes to training to adults, you know, to go, you know, 40 years old, I need to get retrained. Million. Right, it's it's a pittance. Maybe that covers less than yeah. half a percent of what's needed. Right, the the biggest spender in this category is the private sector. Firms are spending. It's a little hard to measure, but let's okay. roughly call it 150 billion dollars a year mm. on training. Is now, that like, up or down? Well, how, how we don't know. We don't measure it because we, we don't stopped, really know. We stopped you know, collecting that data yeah, yeah. in 1985. Right. So before the rise of cell phones, right? So anecdotally, it's down. I think. Uh, anecdotally, oh, oh, it's up. I would uh, yeah. Say. Oh, I think oh, since okay. 2008, I yeah. would say. Right. Okay. I mean yeah. over yeah. the long. I mean over the longer right. term. Look, yeah. there's six and a half million vacant jobs. Business people are putting money into this problem because it's yeah. a business imperative. Yeah. But they spend the money on higher skill, higher wage employers. Yeah. So we employees. Well, they're going to get so the we, most return. Right. But yeah. we, we got to we got to think about them as the biggest investor in this problem, and that is a way. That's where the resources are going to come from to build the kind of training that's going to help that 48 year old. It's going to help the 18 year old. It's going to help everybody in the labor market make sure they're able to access the skills that are going to you know pull them into a good job. Uh, does anybody have a question? Okay, so I'm um, happy to hear what you all have to say. So you all kind of know the rules. No long speeches or I'll cut you off. Feel free to identify yourself. We'd like to know who you are. Hi, my, my, is this on? Um, my name is Hale Bezadi. I'm on the board of a K through 12 independent school and what you're talking about I'm here in California, um, what you're talking about really resonates with the discussions we have on our board. My question to you, is really as, as we accelerate this path toward a career-focused education in high school on the pathway to university, 
Do we think about the mental, um, the, the impact of on, on children with anxiety? Because there is this very large epidemic of anxiety for college age mm -hmm. children coming starting earlier and earlier in high school. And I wonder if we're giving thought to balancing this accelerated path with mental health for young adults who may not be very equipped. Mm -hmm. So I think you should be thinking about it very seriously. I can tell you at UC San Diego, which is very typical of most higher educational institutions, the number of psychological counseling cases is literally growing exponentially. Uh, I cannot tell you how many more CAPS, which is uh, counseling people I've hired in the last uh, five years or so. And it is troubling me uh, on one hand that the cases are growing so fast but I'm glad that we have the resources to hire them and take care of these young men and women. But it is a matter of concern, and maybe it goes back to high school, maybe it goes back to the families, I don't know. Chancha, you mentioned the Swiss oh. internship model, right. which means somebody right. else has already uh, confronted right. this problem, right? right? So it's, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, I think, uh, you know, the reality is that we've got a lot of young people uh, who, um, you know, don't ever make it to college, right? They are. They aspire to go to college, but they, you know, they, if they go, they go for a short amount of time, they drop out, often in debt. Uh, and so I think the idea here is that by giving people an understanding of what they're interested uh, in terms of their career, in terms of their capacities, uh, earlier on, uh, we give people the ability to make more informed choices. I think, you know, I'm no expert here, but my sense of what's happening with this anxiety issue is that we just tell people you must succeed, and you must succeed at this thing called college, right? And anything that's short of that is failure. The whole point of career-focused education is to say, let's invest in people finding out what they really are interested in and making choices based on that, not just on some sort of general BA or bust model. So again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an armchair right. psychologist, but <laughs> I feel like uh, there's something to the, what happens in these other countries, which is that it gives people yeah. a very different information base. Actually, I need to. Right. And, and, and if you add on top of that, oh, and by the way, that career that you choose, oh, it'll be one of 20 that you'll have over your yep. lifetime, yep. and it's all on you. Yep. I mean, you know, you're so anxious by the age of seven. I mean, make a reality <laughs> check. I think what you're talking about, Chelsea, are like it's, this is true in L.A. and San Francisco and big cities. If you look at the number of people in this country who are less than 35 years old who have an undergrad four-year degree, yeah. how many, what, what do you think is the percentage? Anybody want to guess? Uh, 40. 40 percent. Oh, it's more like 35 yeah. percent. Okay, so it's not as many as you think. Just yeah. because we hang around with people mm -hmm. who all have undergrads and our friends and their kids want to go to college, we think the whole, co the whole country is not like that. Uh, you go to small towns, you go to the Bayou of Louisiana, you go to Mississippi, uh, you, go to LA. you will hear a different <laughs> conversation. A different part of LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Go away so, from Beverly Hills. So, so I think, so I think mm -hmm. trying to attribute uh, stress to the need to go to college probably doesn't, I don't know if that makes sense well, to me. Well, there's a lot not. of other life stress. I, exactly. Sure. I mean, Ex right. without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, we had another question out there. I think there's a microphone, so wait for it. Oh, hi, my name is Daryl. I'm part of a um, private tri-campus school system. Um, to, and I have the same frustration working with our folks around computer science. As sort of a kick in the pants to help, you know, states like New York and other states, could colleges, instead of just being the generic science math, put computer science as a requirement, as a minimum requirement of one year to at least get the K-12 development, teacher development, and student development in that direction? Because if the UC schools right. or Cal State schools ask for it, they got they got to um, conform. So I think uh, you might give us more credit than we deserve. So we have something called A through G requirements, right, in California. So you have to pass A through G to be uh, eligible for UC. Doesn't mean you're admitted. Just be eligible. What percentage of students do you think uh, graduate high school with an A through G requirement? Not as many as you would think, right? Uh, so we can put computer science in well, there. What's the number? Do you it's know the actually number? a small number. I mean, I can't. It's like less. Uh, it's not. Uh, 
ballpark. I would think. Ballpark I think it should be 100%. You left us hanging there. <laughs> and yeah. Actually, I just. I can't, I, I can't let we're you do that. Bad I'm, I'm trying to remember the statistic. I, actually, it's a much smaller number than you would think. Okay. A through G is like basic writing, basic algebra, basic, uh, you know, that type of stuff, right? Uh, it's actually way less than you would think, but I can't remember the number. You can just look it up on the web, right? You can just Google it right now. Uh, uh, Somebody get us that number. No, so the only reason I'm not <laughs> quoting a number priority. is because this is being broadcast. I don't want people yeah, to no, think just, the chancellor is lying you in can, public. You, you know? can give the real answer. Yeah, just right. So, so, so I think computer science, adding that requirement would be interesting. So what we do is we go into high schools and we teach, for example, between the time you're admitted in the summer to the time you come to UC San Diego, we teach math and writing in the libraries. And these kids from underserved neighborhoods are allowed to come and take courses so they're better prepared to come into UC San Diego. So I think there's three types of thinking styles that are really significant. And the new college we are building, we're going to have all three in there. One is computational thinking. Understanding the basics, basics of computing is very important. I think the second is entrepreneurial thinking, trying to understand how do you identify opportunities, identify risks. And the third is design thinking, which is open-ended problems, how do you constrain it to focus it and define a problem. And I think these three capabilities should form the basis of general education going forward. These capabilities can come through courses in philosophy, history, geography, I don't care. But these are the thinking methodology styles that I think we have to inject in every young man and woman who's growing up right now. And we need to start earlier. Oh, no, earlier. I, sooner the better. I mean, I, I sit on the board of something called Young Audiences Arts for Learning, which is a, a, a national um, <coughs> affiliate network, serves over five million kids around the country. And the idea is to use the arts for learning. Mm -hmm. So if you talk about elementary school kids, how do you use just use something that feels comfortable and they're still open in their thinking about mm -hmm. in order to teach collaboration, which right. employers say they want, to teach um, creative thinking, to teach you know, teamwork, all of that, spontaneity, all those things that employers presumably say they're looking for, the critical thinking uh, skills. So can I add one quick, so just literally yesterday, we signed, we gave $100,000 to San Diego Unified to this VAPA program which is arts uh, in the high schools. Because I want these young boys and girls to be really understanding more about arts and humanities before, long before they come to UC San Diego because that opens up their mind and learning capabilities in ways that you cannot imagine. So. And ironically, potentially makes them better computer scientists. I, I, would, right? I would think so. Other <laughs> questions? <laughs> well, we're not doing a very good job if we're only, no, if we're one, only uh, triggering two one, questions. One, one back there. Hi, my name is Mom Time with Accenture. Uh, had a uh -oh. question around how do we inject agile ways of um, you know, responding to the job market instead of um, instilling more of a, we're very reactionary, right? So uh, we've seen the, the writing's been on the wall around the job market. You know, we have a skills gap. But educational systems have been very slow to respond in, in, in attacking that. So how do we become, how do we get ahead of that instead of being reactionary moving forward? So I have a biased view. I don't know if I buy your argument. So I'll take you back to 1960, 1970, 1980, where the educational system was focused more on very broad-based uh, general education. In spite of that, when industries that did not exist, when the, uh, that, like for example, financial, engin uh, financial engineering, for example, uh, people doing bond trading, a lot of these were new ideas back in the 80s and 90s. The universities were not teaching it, but somehow people got absorbed, people got employed, life went on just fine. So I think sticking it to the university is saying, you got to give all the skills that the industry needs is actually a big mistake because even industry doesn't know what skills it needs. I think what we need to do is prepare people with great ability to think, problem solve, collaborate, be part of a community, understand how to be inclusive, understand how to be open-minded, and I think that would lead to much stronger uh, uh, worker and society in my opinion. Well, well, you know, I'm, no. I'm poor Brandon's getting picked on here with Gallup, but I think according <laughs> to the Gallup study, you know, most of the people in university at university level 
think they're doing that. Think they're giving business the people that are ready to learn. Because I totally agree that businesses need to uh, be, adapt, be the people to teach the precise skills for that business. But only 11% of CEOs agree with that. And you know, even if you say Gallup is off by a standard deviation, that gap is still jaw dropping. Let me ask. Let me ask. Let me ask. Let me ask. The CEOs are off by two standard deviations. I wouldn't. Let me. Let me. Let me ask. The gap is. Let me. Let me ask. Let me ask this as a follow up question: Should colleges offer more bang for the buck? which is more education in less time, or at least the option for that? So it depends, I mean, this, this right? This is probably a whole other panel so just yeah. 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 Or yeah. give you the option that I, I want an education that's going to prepare me for a job. I'm going to go this track. So and I want that's it that's a career relevant. relevant. That's a community so, college. So do, do yeah. me a favor, right. right? So go look at the top 10 institutions in the country. Go look at what their graduates do. Go track their careers over the next 20, 30 years. That's, there's a very big difference between that and then institutions that are number 450 and 470 and 490. So I think it's not trying to paint the whole higher education yeah. system with a single paintbrush right. is a mistake. Right. Yeah. There are multiple types of higher education systems. Even in the four-year education system, depending on where you are, you get a different class of people coming in. So what we have not done is figure out how to best educate and train the population we are getting. We're using the same method to educate and train everybody. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yes. calculus at UC San Diego is probably the same as some other institution that I will not name, which is ranked number 400, which doesn't make sense That's because right. they're not getting... So I just want to make so one more. Make it very quick. Okay, just the, the idea that part of the, one of the exciting things at World Quant University is the idea that you can go to industry and say, what are you looking for? And then you kind of reverse engineer curriculum, you, that you build in an agility between the stakeholders so that you can innovate. Because the biggest challenge is that you have these, you know, I don't have a brick and mortar institution and I don't have tenured faculty right. that need to be retrained. Yeah. And there should be more institutions right. so like you just, a... you just wrote the description for the follow-up panel at the Milford Conference <laughs> in 2019 because we're finished. It's a deal. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate your thoughts.